What's going on guys? It is Thursday night, so of course that means it is the CBSI Bolo Show where we are covering the first appearances, reader buzz, and variant buzz for our new comic book releases this current week. With me as always is my co-host Jack DeMeo, aka Mr. Bolo. What is going on, buddy? Oh man, it's been a busy new comic book day, Brian. A lot of stuff going on, a lot of controversy in the market. A um, lot to talk about, so I am very excited to be here, Brian. I know I always say that every week, but I think this week I'm a little extra amped up and excited to be here. Yeah, it's been exciting because we've had actually a good couple, like maybe the last three weeks to include this week of comic releases, especially some great stories coming out. Marvel's been crushing it lately. DC has good stories. They're just not really speculation buzz outside of Batman 77, of course, but nonetheless, Great comics all around between Marvel, DC, and of course, independent books. Boom in particular has been crushing it lately. But we're going to get into all of that, especially for the books that came out this week. And as always, this show is available in the podcast version. So make sure you check out the Simple Man's Comics podcast available on iTunes, Google Play, and Stitcher. That way you can listen to it on your commute, listen to it while you're dealing with, like I said, like you're babysitting your kids or doing whatever you want. Working out, hitting that treadmill. Also, we do have a show sponsor for this show, and it is brought to you by Slabbed Heroes. Slabbedheroes.com. Make sure you check them out. If you want a guaranteed 9-8 modern book at a good price, the best of all, though, is the shipping. Talk about bulletproof shipping. You get enough bubble wrap to basically wrap your whole house. So if you guys got hit by Hurricane Dorian, much love out to you guys. But you could use that bubble wrap to help protect your house even, right? Oh, absolutely. I'm telling you, I've gotten slabs from Nick, and it is the best deal on the market because you are going to have some bubble wrap to reuse and ship your eBay stuff going down the road. Right. But he also sells raw comics, and he even has some exclusive variants himself, which one we're going to talk about in this show. Oh, yeah. So, real quick, we will bring up the Bolo list as always, if you are the, if this is your first time here, make sure that you also subscribe to this channel so you'll never miss a future video. But more importantly, what is the Bolo list? It is the Be On The Lookout list that we comes out every week from Jack DeMeo. And he covers first appearances, reader buzz, variant buzz. This list does hit Tuesday nights and the news cycle changes, which we're going to find out within this current week. But where else can we find this list, Jack? Oh, man, you find it anywhere where Simpleman's Comics and CBSI are on social media. So we're talking Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, um, LinkedIn. LinkedIn's the newest place where you can find it. Um, and we are putting this list out there. It is being shared. Uh, it's in the story. It's in the um, the uh, main post and comicbookinvest.com. It's got the list as well as the back issue bolo section. And this week, more than a back issue bolo section, it's more of a classic, a.k.a. Mr. Bolo rant. We're talking cameos versus first appearances. And um, if you heard my argument last night on the Hot and Cold Show, I would say that this article is a little bit better of an argument than I even made there. So I implore you, check that out. So as we have the list up on the screen right now, we do have in the first appearances, we have Spawn 300. We're going to get into that in a little bit, but we also had Lost Millennium. And as the news cycle hit, we got where that, that actual first appearance was in Green Lantern 11. Was that correct? Correct. And there's still going to be some people who are going to argue that cameo versus first full appearance as the character who really fully appears and gets his name in this issue um, did show up in a panel in Green Lantern 10. Um, we talk on this channel about transparency, right, Brian? Like, that is of paramount importance. And it's not something that we're just talking about. It's, it's something that we live. So I'm going to be very transparent about how the list is put together and how a, say, mistake like uh, Legion of Superheroes Millennium being the first appearance gets made. Um, we take the term confirmed first appearance very seriously. And like most mainstream news sources, we try to find a source and then confirm with a second source. Um, in this instance, we did that. We had an initial source um, being comic book resources and an article that they ran. And if you're not familiar with comic book resources, they are one of the most mainstream 
comic book news sites on the market. Um, they reported about a Brian Michael Bendis interview where he talked about the character who appears for the first time in this Green Lantern 11 issue in actuality, um, the Golden Lantern appearing for the first time in Legion of Superheroes. Now, after some investigation after it came to light that that wasn't the case, we find out that that was really a misquoted excerpt from a Den of Geeks interview where Brian Michael Bendis was really saying they're new to Legion of Superheroes, not new altogether. And unfortunately, a lot of media sources, including mainstream media sources, they like to put these like gotcha titles and misleading things in their articles, and that's sort of what happened. But that was only one news source. The second news source that we use, again, in all transparency, I used was the Key Collector app. Um, so after seeing the article, and I had had this book on my radar for a while, this Legion of Superheroes Millennium, and then seeing the Key Collector app and knowing that Nick has worked hard, um, the owner of the Key Collector app, to bring in fact checkers and people who are working um, on his back end to make sure the same way that I'm trying to make sure that we're confirming these appearances, I felt good about it. The interesting thing about this situation is we were both citing the original same article, the CBR article, and both felt very confident in that. And only after talking later in the day did we really realize that we had both done a similar thing. Um, so very early in the day, Key Collector put an alert out on their app and retracted the first appearance, put the corrected first appearance up. I did the same in the comments of our original post. Maybe I should have taken the post down. I, I, I don't know. Maybe I, I, could, I should have redone it. But the post had already been out there for so long. Um, I, I, and I say so long, that's because we put, I put it out Tuesday evening. So to put it, you know, it was still early in the morning before most LCSs were open, certainly not on the West Coast. Um, I felt good about the, the comment section amendment. And he, I even tagged Key Collector in that um in that amendment and you know it's one of those things like we get viewed as a competing resource for key collector so i felt like the fact that i was being transparent and tagging key collector and, and discussing this in the in the um comic book invest cbsi account the official cbsi instagram i felt like this was transparent um there were still some in the spec community and uh facebook trolls and whatnot who wanted to try to throw stones at this um some of these these trolls may be in the chat right now for all we know, but the reality of the situation is um, it, there was no ill intention. Um, it is impossible to read every book, especially before the books come out. Um, again, this list gets put out on Tuesday. Um, we try our best to work with retailers. And if there's any retailer out there who wants to help contribute, reach out. Reach out on Instagram. Uh, Reach out on Facebook. Reach out any anywhere. Um, I'd love to talk to you, and we can, you know, set up some sort of a uh, working relationship. But the reality of the situation is there was no ill intention, um, and it's you know it's one of those things. Like as soon as we were able to realize it, we corrected it, and I, I wanted to be transparent about how that happened. And I still would use comic book resources as a source. I think I will, you know, do some further investigation beyond, but. Um, you know, it happened, but it's not – that's also why we tell you, like, don't just take this list and run with this list. Like, do your own investigation. Make sure that you feel good about a spec play. Um, and um, so that's that. And then we're not really going to go into that anymore because that's kind of all we need to say about that. As far as the Golden Avenger – or excuse me, the Golden Avenger. The, uh, the uh, Golden Lantern. Oh, no, now we're going to get comments. <laughs> right, right. It, there was a Golden Avenger, too. Like, But uh, the Golden Lantern, I actually kind of like the spec play. Whether you're looking at the cameo uh, in 10 or the full appearance in 11, and you know my feeling on that subject, um, I kind of like it. I, I don't know where it's going to go, but Green Lantern spec is so cold right now, and these books aren't heavily printed. Um there, there, it's not a series I'm reading. It's not a series I know a lot of people are reading. Um, so I, you never know. It, it's one of those, for a cover price buy-in, I like it. If you can grab this one for cover, it's a decent grab and stash. And I think copies are still available at most online retailers as of the filming of this video. So whether or not by Thursday evening when this video premieres and when you're seeing me talk about this right now, 
Um, whether they'll be available or not, I'm not sure. But I don't think you're going to see an immediate spike on this book. So it's one to kind of keep an eye out, out for. Um, and also, you know, check your LCS and see if they still have Green Lantern 10 sitting on the shelf. And I would advocate the set, 10 and 11, would be the one to grab and hold. But um, either way, um, that's something to keep an eye out for. And you know what the sad thing about it is? Um, Legion of Superheroes uh, Millennium Number 1 was a great read. Um, there were a lot of good reviews of it. And it got kind of overshadowed by this whole situation, which is unfortunate. But nonetheless... Transparency is key, so we're going to talk about that. Right, and I believe the cover B for this Green Lantern is a Paul Pope variant, right? Yes. And Paul Pope, I mean, he's got a little cult following. A lot of people like Paul Pope. Um, it's not one of my favorite covers of his, but yeah, it is something to take note of. But So that is kind of going to wrap up the first appearance section because we're going to get into the spawn a little bit later on. We're reserving that for, we'll just put it, put it out there now. That's, that's Jack's long-term oh. play. And, but I will tell you a teaser before we get there. It's not my long-term play because of She Spawn. A lot of people assumed that when they looked at this list, but that's not even the reason. It's but we'll because talk of about She that. Spawn's She Shed. <laughs> but we will talk about that later on about why this book yeah. is my long-term play. So real quick, before we get into the Reader Buzz section, I do want to give a shout-out to the Comet Core. If you guys don't check out their YouTube channel, great YouTube channel, great group of people. I don't want to say great group of guys because... We got Caitlin on there as well, and she's fantastic. But I was able to get one of these shirts. They have them available. Check their YouTube channel because they have links in their videos for these. And this is for the Baltimore Comic Con. So we're looking forward as I can't display it right. But uh, so, yeah, big shout out to Comic Core and uh, great channel. They always got a bunch of great videos on there. So we usually, I definitely tune into them usually uh, Friday nights after our FOC show as my camera goes in and out of focus. On my big ass head. But with that being said, we will get into this week's Reader Buzz. And the first book we're going to talk about on the Reader Buzz section for the week is House of X number four. I'm almost bored talking about House and Powers of X. Yeah, we always got House of X, Powers of X. Yeah. I mean, everyone loves them. They're great reads. Um, You know... I'm excited to sit down and read the trade and kind of digest it all in, at once. Um, and, but this, you can copy and paste anything I've said about any other book. The flower variant, the connecting variant, those two seem to be the go-to variants uh, for this book. They were the first to sell out at Midtown. Um, they are, were the first that you start to see posted in pickup halls on Instagram and on Facebook. So... I think stores were definitely more prepared for the cover A so that that book has lingered around Wednesday a little longer than some other ones have. But at the same point, man, the, you can't stop this Hickman run. It's on fire. Right. I mean, it has buzz going before the first issue even came out, and it's definitely lived up to the hype. Right, right. And it's, it's maintained buzz, which I think maintaining buzz is harder than getting the initial buzz. A lot of books get initial buzz. To maintain buzz through readers reading the book and continuing to. And like you've talked about, you know, even non-X readers are, are enjoying this book. Definitely House of X, Powers of X, tag team champions right now for Marvel Yes, readers. Yes, New Day. <laughs> yeah. But. And then the next book for the Reader Buzz section was Absolute Carnage Symbiote Spider-Man number one. This had some buzz going into it, of course. Well, hence being in the Reader Buzz section. But what was the big buzz on this book? You know, there was some talk about a new character wearing the symbiote. Let us know in the chat um, if who that was. I, I talked about this before when I talked about Black Panther um, 15, which is a book a lot of people specced on a week ago. Just because a character wears a symbiote doesn't excite me. The whole point of Absolute Carnage is he's trying to kill every person wearing the um, symbiote codex. suits. Yeah, right. The codex, yeah, right. With the codex, right. You know why I think this book had buzz? And there's every now and again – there's books that don't fit into one of the categories on this this show or in this list. There's two this week, um, and I'll let you guess the other one for yourselves out there in uh, Bolo Nation and Simpleman's Comics family. But cover art. This to me was a cover A, cover art popular book because whenever I saw it posted or talked about it, it was always cover A. I think it has that killing joke feel. Yeah. Um, it's not quite an homage, but it has that kind of feel to it. Because there's and, a camera. 
there's a camera and the reflective um that reflective look similar yeah. to the way that um we're going to talk about something is killing the children later the way that that frizzin variant is an anom is not an homage of the matina gamora variant but it gives you that feel and then that gets people excited but the the, the regular book was selling at a faster rate than the incentives were this is one, if I remember correctly, the solicit almost led to something that would be an absolute carnage or venom might actually take place in this book instead. Because I, I, I remember exactly what the solicit said, but I remember when I read it, that's kind of what I, the, the feeling that I had with it. But Right. So again, let us know in the chat if you read it, what you thought about it. Um, today was a busy, busy day for me, so I didn't get to read as many new comics as I normally would like to on a Wednesday, so let me know. Yeah. Let me know. I plan on catching up over the next couple days. And for me, I'm just I haven't been enjoying the Symbiote Spider Man series, so I'm not picking this up. So let me know if something I, well, I, I I haven't read a single Symbiote Spider Man issue from this run. I, that's full transparency. But you know me, absolute carnage tie and I gotta read it. So then the next one that comes out only when it wants to, it's never yes. late. And we're gonna talk about Doomsday Clock number eleven. This is one so speaking of a series I need to read and trade, I've been reading Doomsday Clock, but I don't know, man. My my younger days of uh, partying and, uh, you know, those 420 activities may have made my memory very uh, unable to retain the information. Well, this book only comes out on a leap year, it seems. Right. <laughs> I can't retain the information. I feel like I'm reading – and first off, there's so much going on in this yeah. book. So there's so much that calls back to stuff. I'm reading the book and I'm always like, well, I feel like this is important. And then you got to go back and read. It makes it not as enjoyable. Um, so I like this book. I can already tell. Um, I really – I talked about this on the channel. I really enjoyed Heroes in Crisis. And this gives me the same feel. And I feel like it's too bad that both of those series were plagued by delays. This one more than any other. Last page reveal um, – we get the uh, kind of like the eye of the OMAC. Um, the interaction on the last page with Superman and um, Dr. Manhattan is very cool. Um, it's exciting to see where they're going to go with this. Um, I need some of my hardcore DC guys to tell me like the OMAC thing. Like where does that really truly play in? Because I, I didn't know if I was fully getting the, um, the importance of that moment. Like maybe that moment was more important than I was grasping. Um, but it's cause it definitely seemed like they were trying to set up something right there. Um, but yeah, so let, let me know. I need one of my hardcore DC guys to let me know what, what all, where is this going? But, um, yeah, th I mean, this book is a great, great reader book. I think sets will do well in the long run, yeah. but I think in the short term, you're never going to be able to make money on this one. Just enjoy the read of this one. And maybe even if you're like me, just stack these in a box and wait till the series is done to read them. Or wait on that trade, because this is a tough one, because who knows when issue 12 is coming. And it's frustrating, because it has such a fantastic creative team between Jeff Johns and Gary Frank on this. Right, yeah, Jeff Johns is maybe my favorite DC writer. Yeah. I'm not, he is my favorite DC writer. Yeah. Definitely. Jeff Johns, Snyder, and then of course, I think Grant Morrison goes up there too, but... Grant Morrison's a little crazy for me, and I'm going to get shot <laughs> for say, saying this, but I go Jeff Johns, Snyder, and then Tom King. Those are my favorites, but I know everybody hates Tom King, but yeah, yeah. I won't say hate him. Some stuff I've says I like, some stuff I don't. But we both do agree that Grayson was awesome. Yes, yes, I I would love more Grayson. Yeah. So we're going to go into the next one, and that is Midnight Vista number one. This is from Aftershock. Kind of has that uh, fire in the sky type feeling to it. Um, we have the A and B cover, but what you might not realize is the cover. On the far right is the actual incentive variant exclusive to Nick at SlabedHeroes.com. So make sure you check out his site up there. He's got nine eights available and raw copies, right? Right. And you know what? I think before we even get into the A or the B, um, let's talk about the fact that he released this book for seven ninety nine for that Virgin exclusive. Nick, look at you, man. I like the move. I, I, I see what you were cooking up there. But either way, um, giving some value to the community. Because you're talking about double cover price for a very low printed virgin exclusive cover. Um, 
in my opinion, an art upgrade over cover A. It's hard to say an art upgrade over that uh, Raza incentive because, boy, I, that thing is sharp to me. Um, and that's no shot at Nick's variant, but that Raza incentive is incredible. Raza but, always has those variants that you have to like double take because a lot of times you think it's a picture. Right, right. And he's. I feel like we've used this. I've used this term at least on the channel several times. But he's like that B level artist where it's like not everything that he comes out with blows up, but anything that he comes out with has the potential yeah. to blow up. Um, it just kind of depends. I like the solicit of this book. I haven't read it, but I ordered it and I'm excited to read it. Um, this is one that feels Netflix to me. Having said that, I got to admit, like I said, we keep it real on this channel. Aftershock Comics hasn't paid off for me as an investment. And we talked about this the last time. How many times am I going to order 10, 20 copies to get some of these incentives and get stuck with these uh, cover A's? Right. I'm ho hopeful of this one. But I've been hopeful of the last couple. Bad reception I ordered. Um, there was one before that. I can't remember. The, last, the one right before that, that was a big one I ordered. Uh, I'll tell you what all it's going to take, though. Is once you start seeing more of their titles, start picking up options because that's the buzz that everyone waits around for. As soon as you see like one or two, people are gonna go back and start picking up some of these books because they don't want to miss out on anything. Because well, come to it's Mr. not Polo. It's, it's not a fact that their stories are bad. It's just for some reason the market isn't attracted to them, or they they they're bottle rockets, man. They they head up high and then they just fizzle off real quick. What I'm noticing um, from doing live sales at conventions recently is people, people, a lot of people are buying indie books from me because you know there's not a lot of dealers at conventions selling indie books. But Aftershock books, they're not familiar with. So I don't know whether it's Aftershock's marketing team. We talk about this, whether it's the Indie Spotlight series show or um, just on the things we talk about on this channel. Um, you know, We've talked about the fact that it, it, indie books, it's largely based on how much the creative team is going to grind or the publisher and so like mad cave studios is a tiny tiny um company but chris sanchez their director of pr he is a hustler so he will get those books in front of as many people as possible so he makes a mark in the industry i don't know if aftershock's got that going again that's no shot at aftershock um i like a lot of their books we might just be unaware as well yeah but i just we're not i'm not seeing it and we're, brian let's be honest we do social media so if anybody should see it it should be us um, so, you know, that's just the, the reality of it. But this book, the solicitation talks about, you know, a boy and I think his stepfather who are abducted and, you know, they, they're presumed dead. They're gone for years and years. And suddenly the boy comes back and he's an adult and he remembers everything. And so it's kind of like, where's it going to go from there? That sounds like a movie to me. That sounds like a Netflix sh show. Uh, it's exciting. And again, I like the Raza variant, 1 in 10 incentive. I think the fact that maybe these Aftershock books have been lesser of spec plays could make that Raza variant long term be a good one. Um, and again, I like Nick's variant. I think what what's printed out of 300 copies, Brian? Yeah, I believe so. I mean, that's a low print run. So, you know, and for seven ninety nine, it's worth a gamble. Um, so, yeah, I, I like the book. I, I think this one is one that has potential, but... As I said, I've been fooled with these um, these uh, Aftershock books in the past. And while um, we're on the sort of the topic, I mentioned the Indie Spotlight series. I also want to send a shout out to our brother from the channel, Andy Tomberlin, who took a leave of absence recently from CVSI dealing with some personal stuff. Heart goes out to him. You know, it's private, but we, we want to still at this point say – that we love Andy, and um, Andy's not gone from CBSI. He will be back, um, and we're just keeping his spot warm. So the Indie Spotlight series, immediately when I got the information that Andy was leaving, and I found out just like the rest of you guys on Instagram, um, Andy's my boy, uh, you know, but he didn't give me a heads up. You know, he just he put, put that post up, and um, I immediately reached out to him, and I said, man, you want me to take over that column and keep it, keep it running? So... I am now writing the Indie Spotlight Series article on comicbookinvest.com, um, and I'm just trying to keep that momentum alive because Andy has built a monster with that column, and I'll be happy to pass that back to him. And after writing my first one, I told him, man, this is a lot of work. You do you do a heck of a job because I just used his template to write that article, and Andy, Andy does an amazing job writing that column. He puts a lot of work into it, and after writing my first column um, and... I put 
I almost an embarrassing number of hours into writing that article. Um, I will say, man, I have nothing but the utmost respect for Andy. So, um, Andy, take care of yourself, buddy. Um, and when you're ready, man, it's all you, buddy. Uh, you know, I, I didn't do this for me or for us or for CBSI. That I, I want, I want to make that very clear. Um, that's Andy's column. That's Andy's brand. And um, whenever he's ready, it's all his. Got you, got his back, but yeah, huge shout out to Andy. Um, can't can't fill his shoes. We can just try to carry it as much as we yeah. can until he's ready to come back for it. So um, take your time, get just take care of what you need to get taken care of. But we got you back, and we're always here. So yeah, absolutely. And we're gonna go right into the next one on a reader buzz, and that is another independent book, and we're talking about James Tenney and the Fourth's Something Is Killing the Children. Uh, and, uh, man, let me tell you something. I could have made this the long-term spec play, right? I mean, that's probably what you all were expecting out there, right, Simpleman's Comics family? Because we told you about this book. But I felt like, you know what, that's another redundant rant if I start, you know, patting me and Brian on the back. Again, you can copy and paste everything I said with Once in Future. This was a rune sing. Let us know about this. I will tell you, if you're comparing this to Once in Future, Brian, I don't know how you feel about this. I think this is a better spec play, long-term. This one feels more adaptable. Um, I said this book is effed up when I was my initial reaction on this channel. Um, I think it's incredible. And that was before the Frizen variant. Before anybody wants to talk about the Frizen variant, that was just getting a PDF and only seeing that cover A. We didn't know what else was coming. But you also got the cover B, the J. Lee variant. Um, I think that's the overlooked cover. I would guess... That's the lowest ordered cover, Brian. Would you would you agree? Yeah, I think so. Because I think you know a lot of people go cover A heavy, and obviously we talked about why that makes sense when a, a property gets adapted. But then right before FOC, Boom does this. They have FOC variants. They do it on most all of their titles. They drop one at the last second, and again they just did it for Age of Resistance, the Dark Crystal book. Yes, yes, and we that talked Christian about it. Ward book. And we talked about it on the last call. But don't worry, it's past F FOC, so we didn't get in on that one. If only yeah. there was a show that told you about it. Right. And then pissed and, everyone else that didn't like it off. Yes, and all those who thought they were going to be able to hoard those copies and uh, not spread them around the community. But people expected this book to tank. And they, again, we didn't. We weren't the ones who alerted everyone on this frizzing variant. Mm -mm. What happened was... This Frizen variant came out. It's undeniably gorgeous. That's not my opinion. That's not Brian's opinion. That's everybody who ever looks at this book. And so what did every retailer do? And I'm talking about every retailer, whether it was the big ones like Midtown or the variant online. They producers. advertised it. They're like, online. what the Frizen? Yeah. Right. They put out those email blasts. And this is the thing, guys. Every time you buy something from an online site, they now have your email. And they're sending you those emails. Everyone got that email with that Frizen variant, and you looked at it, and you said, well, for $3.99, or some as much as 20 to 30% lower, because it was pre-FOC, which is another reason why we have the last call show, so you can get those books at the lowest possible price, um, people ran and bought that, and rightfully so. And everyone's like, well, you know, the print run got jacked up at that point. You don't know what the overprint was going to be. You don't know what Boom was planning to print. Um, yet we None of us do. We don't know. So to, to, that's a major assumption that people are making um, because Boom knew that this Frizen variant was coming out. So all those numbers that everyone had pre-Frizen variant, that's only the information we had available to us at the time. It, it, that's the funniest thing about that this whole situation. So the whole fallacy of if nobody talked about it, you know, it would be a $30 book. That's something I heard today from a speculator I really respect. Um, I just don't think that's reality because I think this book, they, Boom knew this book was going to be hot. They were prepared. If, if no one talked about it, it could be a $3 book and then people are going, why are people talking about it? It's available on their website for cover right now. Exactly. Because that's what it would be. It would be on Boom's website, which is what Boom does. They also sell direct to consumer. Um, and... The reality is Boom knew when they got this cover, oh, this is going to be hot, especially when they already saw what the sales of A and B were, um, and especially when they already knew what the guts of the books were. They felt confident in this book. 
Trust me when I tell you, we had a Rune Singh on the channel. He felt confident about this book. And he told you so. Simpleman's Comics Family. So, again, shout out to Andy Tomberland, the Indie Spotlight Series show. Um, and so, you know, we, we were advocates for this book because we saw what was happening with Once in Future and we felt like the same kind of thing was happening. Flash forward to today and you're seeing even that prison variant was selling for as high as $20 pre-sale a couple days ago. Yes, it's dropped down to about $12 to $15 right now. But it's trading hands. People are buying it. Um, it's going to be a solid book. Let's not forget it's a $4 cover price book. So we're still talking three times cover the day of release. And that's with all of that. And again, there's nobody you can get mad at. This wasn't a speculation community discussion pre-FOC. This was retailers, publishers, um, everyone. Everyone who saw this book posted this thing and said, this thing is gorgeous. It was um, even on like the Hollywood Reporter. Right. Right. So you can get as mad at Brian and I as you want to. You can make all your little Facebook posts, you little keyboard warriors. Guess what? You're not. What are you going to do about the Hollywood Reporter? How are you honestly going to control that? Right. We had nothing to do with that. And, and the good thing is, is it's it's no longer a miniseries. It's now an ongoing. Which makes it a better long-term spec play. Because we all know that the ongoing is better if you're trying to sell something as a, a movie or a TV show. Because you can do sequels or you can do a TV show and have multiple seasons. This was a good thing. And again, keeping those print runs uber low, that may help you flipping books. But like the, the writer of Dead End Kids, I've had conversations with him, Frank Ogle. He, he doesn't do comics full time. He wants to do comics full time, but he needs to sell more books. So I'm sorry, speculators out there who are mad about that kind of stuff. You making an extra 50, 100 bucks is not going to take precedent over the guy who's putting the work in to produce those books being able to make a living. And if you think that it should, then uh, you got to take a serious look in the mirror. I mean, that's it. I'm not going to sit here and continue to be chastised for that kind of stuff. So we made the decision. And here's the bottom line. I know most of you, I'm preaching to the choir, and I apologize for getting salty about this because the reality is we put the word out and we said, what do you guys want? Because we, we're we here to serve our community. We're not here to serve speculators as a whole or any subset or group or publishers. We're here to serve Simpleman's Comics family. And I got my Muhammad Ali shirt on right now. I'm ready to fight for you guys. And we said to you all, what do you want? And you guys said – a resounding do it this is the information we need so we're all in and we're there with you and we're excited about it last call friday nights the pre-foc show it's not going anywhere and uh, it's only gonna get bigger and better so you know keyboard warriors you know you, facebook spec groups you can get as mad as you want but nothing nothing's gonna change about it yeah but we're gonna move on into the next book on the list and that's going to be going to the chapel number one. This is from what? Action Lab, Danger Zone? Action Lab. And you know what? This has a little bit of that Cristiano Ronaldo feel to me, Brian. <laughs> well, Action Lab books are, are one of those books that um, they, they might get some buzz. And then, of course, like release day, you'll see something that they kind of tip off a little bit. But then usually by like the weekend, you kind of see them die down. But they're... Minus the outliers, right? There's some zombie tramp books out there, of course, right. that are always those Mendoza books that are always garnering some love. But yeah, going to the chapel, this is one of those ones that looks great, the solicit sounds great, and you're like, man, this is like a almost like a Tarantino slash that's preacher I, that, type, that's you know. What, that's what I get from it. I get a Tarantino feel when I read. I'm glad you said that because I was going to make that point, Brian. Yeah. That tells you sometimes you and I don't agree on things, <laughs> but we see things the same way sometimes. Yeah. I read the solicit. You're talking about, you know, Elvis impersonators robbing a wedding. Um, it feels like a movie. Yeah. And it feels like a, you know, kind of a grindhouse Tarantino style movie. Um, then I then you go and I kept having people mention it to me, which is, again, how things get on the bolo list. I see it on Instagram. I see it on Twitter. People kept talking about this book. So I was like, man, what is this Action Lab book? Because, yeah, that's what I attribute Action Lab to those like Vamp Blade type releases and um so i was like what is this book so go to the old midtown comics app and every cover except cover a is sold out 
I was like, man, is there something going on here? But you know what? I just don't think it was heavily ordered because you look on eBay and there's only a few copies available online. All the sales are at cover price. So this is a puzzler to me. I just – I think – I would love to know the print run. I don't think it was very high. Um, but I'm interested to read it. Yeah, I ordered a reader copy, um, you know, a cover A just to read because I think the solicitation is interesting. And uh, if I read it and it excites me as much as the solicitation made it sound like it might, I may make a spec put on it. I've Honestly, I've never speculated on an Action Lab release before. Um, I feel like I'm going borderline Zenoscope there. But at the same point, um, you know, the Watcher was hot, right? So you never know. Um, but if anybody out there read this book, let us know. Let us know what you thought about it. This is why I love the live chat. I love that back and forth let us know what you thought about it and uh brian and i are in the chat and we'll talk about it yeah yeah if anyone read it it's um the comic book villain uh, his haul videos man on youtube i think he he gets almost every book that releases so <laughs> definitely check him out but we're gonna go into the the last book on the reader buzz this week and that was archie and friends back to school and you could tell right away just from the cover why this had some reader buzz attached to it right Right. So I mentioned one other book on the list is on here essentially for its cover art. Did you guess this one? Because this would be it. This sold out at large retailers, Midtown, TFAW, um, leave my comic shop as well. Um, only, I think it only had cover A. Um, I highly doubt most of you are buying this to read. I put it in the reader buzz column because that's really where it fits. But um, that nostalgia stuff works, man, especially with that 80s crowd. And so – how many Back to the Future homages have we seen, Brian? Several, right? Yeah, I mean, they just did one with the, was it the Jughead, the Time Cop, or the Jughead yeah. Time comic? Couple, so, like, but yeah, I mean, Back to back to School, and the Back to the Future homages, we've seen quite a few of, but every time you see it, it kind of hits you in the feels, because, I mean, shoot, Michael J. Fox, man, Christopher Lloyd. I mean, if you grew up in the 80s, Back to School. Doesn't get better, right? Yeah. So, yeah, so I mean, I, I didn't read this book. I have no intention of reading this book. It's not a book I'm going to speculate on, to be honest with you. But it doesn't surprise me that it sold out. It is one long term you never know. You never, ever know because I can't imagine it's printed too heavily. And I believe it's a kid's title, like an all ages sort of release. Um, and if you want me to get really morbid with you, um, at some point, Michael J. Fox will pass and all of this stuff will become huge nostalgia and heavily talked about. And uh, <laughs> got a new subscriber. Don't buy the okie doke. <laughs> yeah, don't do it. <laughs> and um, this book will probably be one of those books that you can sell really well, but don't make that spec play. Don't make the Michael J. Fox death spec play. I'm not advocating that. I'm just saying that that's something I, I see happening because that's just the way things work. But, um, but yeah, I mean, maybe you weren't aware of this one. So I thought this would be a fun one to include on the bullet list since I saw people talking about it. I was like, you know what? Let's put it on here because I've had some books like this in the past. It's kind of a lighter week, heavy at the top, but less in number from like last week's giant tiny font list. Right. And speaking of Michael J. Fox, I might be lone here, but I actually enjoyed Teen Wolf better than I liked Back to the Future. <laughs> but, I love Teen Wolf, yeah. though. Let's read. Give me a keg of beer. But. <laughs> That wraps up the reader buzz, and sorry for people that aren't 80s children, but giving 80s movie references out. Either way, great reader buzz section. Before we get into the variant buzz, if you guys are watching this, please click that thumbs up button, or I'm sure we probably have some thumbs down. We're talking about FOC and some of the rants that have been going on here, but we're always about integrity and community here, so we can't, we're not going to change what we talk about just because we, that's what people want us to do. So. Yeah, your thumbs down is not going to scare us. And all, all those uh, thumbs down before we even start the videos aren't going to deter us either. Right. And, I mean, for everyone that is watching, giving us a thumbs up, we, we appreciate you. We're happy to have you part of the Simple Bands Comics family. And that's what makes the community what it is. That's what the channel is here for to begin with. But make sure you click that thumbs up button. And if you haven't done so and you're enjoying this content, please make sure you just click that subscribe as well. That way you'll be notified when future videos get released. And with that being said... We are going to roll into the variant buzz section for the week. 
kicking off the variant buzz we're going back to another indie another boom book and this is once in future number one third print yeah so now if your second print got allocated and you got sent to a third print and you were very upset about that and you were in it for a speculation play you kind of shouldn't have shouldn't be worried about it should you brag no because this thing was going for 25 dollars right now um solidly yeah, and the good thing is it seems like each cover they do with these additional printings, they're all, I won't say better than the, the previous one, but they're all freaking fantastic. Like each one you see, right. like, oh my God, that's so cool. And I got tagged from someone on Twitter. I'm sorry, whoever tagged me. Um, if, you're in the, if you're in the chat, um, let me know who you are. I apologize. Um, I'll, I'll throw you up on my um, Instagram story or something. Um, someone tagged me that the fourth print sold out at Midtown in 20 minutes. Yeah. That's all. 20-minute runtime. Um, so, you know, there's no signs of slowing down with this book. I think the fourth print could end up doing similar numbers. Uh, we've talked about this book a few weeks at, kind of out of the last month. Um, so I don't feel like we need to go heavy into it. This is this book is a serious, serious winner. Um, and if you haven't read it yet, please go read the book. It's a great book. I think it's going to be a, a solid long-term play. It's it's new Haya. Was the person on Twitter? Oh, there you go. That's right. They tagged you as well, yeah. right? New Haya. Yeah. N e w h e y a h. Right there you go. Or at Haya New on Twitter. Yeah, they were tagging this, and it also, not to go back to, uh, something's killing the children, but issue number one just came out, and it was already on what like fourth print as well. I think they're on right. before. So, Boom's definitely doing something with their their. Their marketing and getting the orders in. Right. And this past weekend, I was set up at a convention and the very first book I sold, I told you this, Brian, kind of early in the day, very first book I sold, once a future second print. Somebody walked right up. I had it on my wall and they said, is that the second print? I said, yep. How much? Told them 30 bucks. Yep. I'll take it. So, you know, these books are hot and people are looking for them. Right. And then the next one for the variant buzz, we talked about the frame variants before, but hot this week or uh prominent this Talk, week from marvel talked about what's that i'd say talked about yeah i say prominent not so much as yeah. hot but we had this callback to that immortal hulk variant that everyone was talked that was heavily talked about but now we're having like the immortal wraparound variants for multiple titles especially fantastic four this week had a bunch of them yeah and i gotta be honest with you i kind of like them i like the doom I one I know people. I know people. This is this is one of the things I like to use the term polarizing on the channel a lot because people are talking about them. Half of them are like, I, I like these. I'm going to put this set together. Half of them are like, Oh my god, I hate these. And you know what? I think a lot of our negativity comes from the actual Immortal Hulk variant um, and the whole situation that happened with that and the mess with second print incentives that that book started. Cool thing about these are, and this is no disrespect to Joe Bennett. But Joe Bennett's not everyone's favorite artist. And these books are done by a bunch of different artists. So like the Doom book you brought up. I think that's Ryan Brown. Yeah. Ryan he's a Brown. rising. Talk about rising star. I was about to say, he has got some momentum going behind him. Um, but yeah, you got, you've got the uh, Immortal Hulk 23 Harpy variant up there. Um, you see uh, Punisher. And I love the whole Vietnam aspect of that. Um, I think that... Fantastic Four is not a heavily, heavily ordered book. Having four variants from Fantastic Four could lead to lower print runs of those books individually. I will tell uh, you, if Legend is in here watching right now, he definitely ordered it because he's a huge Fantastic Four fan. Another guy from go. Comic Core. And Comic Man Andy. Yep. Did you order this Punisher? Did you get on this Punisher? Um, he's, a, he's the biggest Punisher guy I know. Um so, you know, it, I'm interested to see. I like these variants. I, I think people will have a strong opinion either way. Hey, chat, let us know. What do you think? And we talked about one of these variants on the last call show last week, didn't we, Brian? Yep. At ASM 30, the fact that there's no cover art. And we've heard, I've heard speculation, Brian, everywhere from Red Goblin. I've heard Dylan in his whatever form he's going to take as possibly Venom. And um, I also heard that villain that ASM has been kind of slow playing, Kincaid. Could that be a Kincaid variant? Um, all possibilities. Did you order that ASM 30 Immortal variant? And we're past FOC, so again, all you guys are going to cry. Um, 
if you didn't order it and you didn't watch the last call show last week, now, you know, maybe you can still jump on that. Um, there is a reorder period. There is a period where Diamond has overages. ASM tends to be one of those books. So if you didn't know, now you know. All right. Then the next book in Variant Buzz was The Magnificent Miss Marvel number five, second print. Now, when we talked about the first print, right, Brian? We neither of us liked it. We were like, I'm not call first of all, I'm not gonna call it the first appearance because it's a costume. Uh the the other book, the first print, it had the you know, su uh Secret Wars number eight homage going for it. But you know what's kind of changed my opinion on this? Star I changed my opinion with the fact that the, I actually, for the first time, I've really read a Captain Marvel book, and the story's been interesting. This, that whole new Miss Marvel show, who's to say she's not going to be wearing this costume? What if they created this similar to the way I feel like Ghost Spider was changed? Ghost Spider, I feel like, was changed to make her more accessible in the MCU. I kind of feel, which now is a mess because of Sony, we know that, but Miss Marvel... Um, I feel like this costume change may have something to do with that. Could be wrong. Could be wrong. But if she shows up with this costume, tell me that this is not going to be a key book. This reminds me of maybe um, Iron Man 304, 305 with Hulkbuster, that type of key where it's not like a – I'm not saying it's going to surpass any of those first appearances because Lord knows Miss Marvel's first appearance is an anomaly. It's a mess. It's, you know – Captain Marvel 14, 17, 17 second print, point one, whatever that you want to go with. But I would I would venture a guess that this book is a lower print run, um, that this book does not have a high print run. I think a lot of people jumped on the first print because of the homage. That cover art was released early. Um, it's funny. I was talking junk about that book the, on the Bolo show the week it came out. And then my diamond order showed up with a bunch of copies of that book. So I was like, oh, man, here I – see, anybody who's saying I'm pump and dumping, I can't even keep track of my own orders. So all of a sudden I'm talking negatively about a book and a book shows up. And I'm like, oh, wow, I didn't even realize I ordered this book. So, um, you know, I don't know. I've come around on this book, but it all depends on that TV show. It's, it's, I'll say it has a chance now. Not so much um, – not saying it's a good play. Not saying it's a bad play. I'm just saying it has a chance. And if you see this book, I would grab it because I wasn't even aware this book was coming out. This wasn't one that was my radar. And then all of a sudden, I saw a couple posts on it last second. This was probably the last book I added to the list. So be on the lookout for this one. I'm sure the print runs low. And if you've already got first prints, grab a couple second prints to stick with it. Right. I have zero. Don't plan on buying any. I'm just not... Miss Marvel isn't. <laughs> I'm just not that big into Miss Marvel. It's not, and you know what, Brian? It's really not made for you. Yeah. I don't think Miss Marvel exists for 35 to 45 year white guys. I think it's just reality. It's and not everything's for everybody, and that's cool. Um, because there's people that this character resonates with. Um, and like I said, I'll I will spec on that. I'm good with that. It doesn't have to be something I love, as long as I see other people loving it. But you tend to, you're a buy what you like guy. So if you don't like it, you're not getting in on it. And I respect that about you. Yeah. But that's yeah. that's where you you and I kind of differ on that. Yeah, I have limited real estate, so I don't buy books that I can't can't store. And then like, yeah, it's just yeah. yeah I, I would be too embarrassed to turn this camera around backwards and for you guys to see the mountain of short boxes and long boxes. That currently adorn this tiny, tiny, tiny room that I'm filming in right now. So yeah, for those that like Miss Marvel, have at it. And then as Jack said, but with that being said, we're just going to move right along into the next Variant Buzz book. And that was Lois Lane number three. Yeah, this is one I'm kind of excited to talk about. I think this book, this series is under people's radar. So... This book is in the Variant Buzz, and it's in the Variant Buzz because it sold out at Midtown. And when I saw it get posted, most commonly, this is the cover that was posted. Um, this is uh, Nicola Scott. Yeah. Having said that, most of the posts when you read what they were saying, they were talking about the enjoyment of reading the book. Um, 
a quote from a guy I really respect, editor from Mad Cave Studios, Brian Hawkins. He said that this book feels like an indie book. And that is a kind of common, um, you know, common uh, interpretation that I've heard of this. This book features like a 17-year-old Jonathan Kent, so a little older Jonathan Kent. Um, I think it could be a sleeper series. I think I'm going to wait for the trade. Let's be honest. Lois Lane wasn't a book that I was like, when that book got solicited, my original reaction was, why? Who wants to read a Lois Lane book? And then I saw that Jimmy Olsen also got solicited at the same time. And even though that is uh, written by Matt Fraction, is a writer I like, I was kind of like, those are two books. I guess they're doing them together. They're trying to round out the Superman family, but not books I would be interested in. And the Jimmy Olsen has the Ben Oliver cover beats. Yes. And this series had Adam Hughes for issue one. Yeah. But I ordered several of the Adam Hugheses because I, you know, you know I, I'm addicted to these DC cover bees. I can't say no. But at the first few conventions I set up in in the last couple months, I sold all the Adam Hugheses. They all moved for five, and then I upped the last couple to six, and they sold. So not huge profit when you're talking about buying pre-FOC for, you know, two and change to three, but they sold. And I realized people are buying this stuff. Um, and I think it's it's under a lot of people's noses. I think there's probably many of you out there who could find issues one through three, maybe even those gorgeous cover bees at your LCS. Not saying jump on them, just saying keep your eye on it. Right. Then the last one for the variant buzz this week was the art germ connecting Harley and Poison Ivy variant, right? This was for um, Harley and Poison Ivy number one. Harvey? Yes. Harley and Ivy number one? Well, I think it's Harley, Harley Quinn and Poison Ivy. I think it's the full name. I shortened it for right. the graphic. Um, I think these are gorgeous. Um, I love this. I think connecting variants are popular right now. A speculator I respect who I'm not going to name because I'm going to kind of trash what he said but he said um that he thought they should be a, a wraparound um now i wouldn't want that then you put it in a bag and board and you or can't a gatefold see the, cover right but then you can't see it in the bag and board i like it the way that it is i think they did yes it's a cash grab to get you to buy two covers absolutely um but let's be honest i don't know a ton of people who are going to read this series um this is a cover art sales series Again, and before I get comments, that doesn't mean some of you didn't read this series. That, that doesn't mean some of you are. I said that about Red Sonia on the Indie Spotlight series, and I had some Red Sonia fans with their Red Sonia swords come at me and say, I read the series. But on the whole, people don't read those Dynamite series. It's the cover art that sells those series. Um, I think the same is true when we're talking about Harley and Ivy type books. Um, people haven't loved the writing of Harley Quinn for quite some time. I'm uh, actually Brian. Do you know who the writer is in this series? I'm not. I'm not 100 percent sure. I no, because I've been following it. Hauser. Yeah, I, oh, it's Hauser. Jody Hauser. Okay, I like so, Jody Hauser. Mother Panic. So, may, so maybe this will be a step up. Um, quite possibly. I like Jody Hauser. So, um, so you never know. Maybe I'll check it out. But this to me was a the connecting play. There's a ton of store variants for this one ton of store variants out there yeah. but this is one of those books where i feel like the cover b and c stand up to any store variant that any store put out there are art germs a heavyweight and he did his thing with these and i think it's a great set um i hope it gets overlooked and it becomes a nice long-term spec play because we've got the birds of prey movie i know that ivy isn't necessarily scheduled to be in that movie but i think wherever harley quinn is poison ivy isn't far away i hope they can get the harley quinn thing figured out because i think margot robbie is a good harley quinn um i think they just got dc movies we talk about it all the time on the channel they're, they're just a mess right now but hopefully you know what, they get it going you know what i think would have been cool for this connecting variant is if art germ did one and then Derek chu did the other and you wouldn't know the difference you yeah could also brought in a third and had kendrick Lim do it and you still wouldn't know the difference yeah. but i mean the way that because um Derek Chu came up in Art Germ School or something like that, right? Or 
Yes, yeah, same with Kendrick Lim. Yeah, they're they're all yeah. disciples of uh, Archer. So it would be cool, is, especially the way Derek Chu's been doing the heart, some of those Harley variants and the Supergirl variants and stuff like that to have the same same type of connecting cover, but have each one do one of the covers would have been kind of cool to see. Right, the relationship, their relationship of those three artists is very similar to like Michael Turner, Paul Green, and uh, J. Scott Campbell, who all kind of came up in this under the same banner. So you have sort of similar art styles. And that's going to wrap up the variant buzz section for tonight. And with that being said, we're going to go into Jack's long-term play for the week. And as we kind of mentioned earlier, so it's no surprise, Jack's long-term play is Spawn 300. Right. And, you know, first thing we're going to do is we're going to touch on the first appearance. It is the first appearance of a new She-Venom. Or, excuse me, She-Spawn, right off the bat. Um... And uh, she Venom. If I've been talking Venom with these first appearances so much. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so first appearance of, uh, of She Spawn. So in the graphic, I have She Spawn. And uh, there were some people who got mad about that, and they pointed out a previous She Spawn. But here's the thing. I've read Spawn comics, so I know the character you're referring to, and it's NYX. Um, and that character also went by she spawn but she spawn was not her main moniker that was more of like a secondary nickname you know what her other moniker was god um so if, if a new character came out called god i don't think we'd have this controversy but that's nonetheless if you google her you're not going to see she spawn that's not going to be the name on comic vine that's not going to be the name you're going to find anywhere on any resource but Todd McFarlane wanted a new she spawn. We have a new she spawn. It's Jessica Priest. Jessica Priest first appears. There's an argument whether it's uh, Curse of Spawn 12 or the more commonly accepted first appearance of uh, Spawn 61. She is the character who is the redheaded villain in the beginning of the Spawn movie, the female villain. Um, she was replacing another character who they didn't in the story who they didn't want to use in the movie, but, um, that's just a little piece of trivia there. Um, she, uh, is the new, she spawn. She appears last page, splash page. It's actually a double page. It's pretty cool. Todd's got the word boxes explaining, you know, Jessica priest, blah, blah, blah. And then it says big, nice letters with the, the cool kind of like, um, almost, um, trade dress style lettering where it says she spawn. And, you know, he didn't say, he didn't call her NYX. He called her She-Spawn. So I think that was a concerted effort with that. Now, this character was teased. A lot of people believe 301 this was going to happen. And I think Todd, he learned his lesson with Venom, which is why Venom was on my mind. Um, first appearance of Venom is ASM 299. We can argue all day about that, but the first time Venom appears and appears in full, he's on panels, he speaks, is ASM 299. But for whatever reason, ASM 300 is the first appearance. And that's what's accepted by the market. Todd McFarlane was the artist on both of those issues. I think he learned a little trick with that. And so She Spawn shows up. He knows there's going to be some buzz there. Um, and then She Spawn appears in full on um, in 301. And you end up getting nice sales for both issues. Um and there's a large assumption when I put this list out that that's why Spawn 300 is my long-term play of the week. Here's the reality. I actually had nothing to do with it. This was my planned long-term play of the week prior to even knowing about She Spawn showing up in this issue. And here's why. Yes, this will have a high print run. Let's get that right out of the way. I think there's rumors, Brian, of like a 300,000 print run. Um, apparently they delayed FOC a bit, so it went from like 200,000 to 300,000. Here's what you got to look at. You can't have it both ways. Is there 15 covers and that's a ton of covers and it's too much? Or is the print run too high? You can say, well, it's both. And I can say, well, fine. But then you have to take that print run and divide it amongst the total number of covers. Because here's the reality. Some of those covers are going to spike down the road. Well, I just liked finally having Spawn covers that the art didn't change on like we've had before with Spawn books. 
That's true. <laughs> that they actually ended up matching the solicit. You and I, you and I are two guys who we like Spawn. We got burnt, and then we we kind of passed on it for a while. Um, I would have liked. I will say this. I would have liked to have seen some Matina um, in this whole thing. I think Matina played a large role in the popularity of Spawn in the in the two hundreds, late two hundreds, but. Uh, for whatever reason, he's not there. Um, J. Scott Campbell, Greg Capullo's there. Um, Jason Sean Alexander's there. Todd McFarlane himself is there. We've got trade dress covers. We've got virgin covers. We've got black and white covers. We've got incentives. Um, there's a 1 in 25 and a 1 in 50 incentive. We've got a ASM 300 parody issue, um, which it seems to be the one most people are talking about. Not my pick long term, I would think, and just because they already did that with what two twenty seven, um, that's already like a hundred dollar book. But that's the point I'm making. This is the long term play. So again, when I'm talking long term play, I'm talking about down the road. I'm not talking about in a month. I'm not talking about in two months. I'm just saying in general, in a while, it might be two years, it might be five years. But go look at what Spawn one hundred does. Go look at what Spawn two hundred does. Both of those landmark issues are popular, and they sell very well, and they sell well over cover price. Um, I have no doubt that by the time we're sitting at, say, Spawn 350, you'll start to notice that several of these covers are well over cover price, and that cover price is $7.99. So um, I have no doubt that some of these covers will get sold cheaper than cover price at some point. Um, some of the larger retailers may end up putting these on their sale list. I have no doubt that's when they're a great buy. If you can grab these, if God forbid these end up on like a 75% off sale at Midtown, I'll be all over that. But um, I think long term, look at let's just look at the trend of the last few years. You can bring up the low print run of like those issue 185, issue 184 area. Um, yeah, they're low print run. And they're selling for that reason, but they're also it's also one of those titles similar. I talk about with GI Joe or Ninja Turtles or Power Rangers. There's a built-in core fan base, and that fan base is kind of trained to put together sets, master sets, meaning they want all covers of every issue, and that's what they've been trained to do. And I think they will do that here, and it, that'll be easy right now. It's real easy to buy um, 15 or 17 cover lots. Um, you can buy them on eBay. You can buy them from online retailers. It's not hard right now. So it's easy to sit here and say, Mr. Bolo, you're crazy. But will it be that easy six months to a year from now? History has said no. History has said it will not. Um, I have watched, in, just in my time as a speculator over the last eight to ten years, I have watched spawn books that were easy to get be in every box for three to five dollars then disappear and then be unable to find now add in the fact that there is a first appearance in this issue now i don't know what he's going to do with jessica priest uh she spawn um we don't know yet but if he does have big plans for her could be something with the first appearance but again that's not even my thought my thought is just these run builders are going to need these books and again you're gonna look at the. You're tempting to look at the total print run because that's how like Comic Cron's gonna list it. And let's say you say there's three hundred thousand, right? Well, guys, that's only twenty thousand per cover. That's not that high in comparison to what the market tends to bear. Um, so, and that's if they're all even, and we know they won't all be even. Some of them were released with a short window. Um, some of them were released later and just didn't, you know, you didn't have as much time. So I, I promise you those, those covers will be lower printed. Um, and we're not going to know which ones are harder to get for a little while, but there's going to inevitably going to be probably two or three that pop early. Um, also those incentives, those incentives will be tougher to get. Um, they'll go for more money. Um, they'll dry up first. Um, and those are ones to pay attention to. And, I, I don't think if you bought the incentives, you know, right off the bat today, you're going to be able to make money for a while. That's OK. Not everything is a quick burn and turn. And that's why this is the long term play. That's why I said I could put something that's killing the children in here right now. But you can already sell that set for thirty dollars. I could put once in future third print, but you can already sell that book for twenty five dollars. And I don't know if you should pass that money up if you can turn either of those two. This is an opportunity to get in on something 
and make money long term. This is something I think will grow um, and will rise in value. Um, issue 301 is very important because that's where you're going to find out she spawned. But here's the biggest thing. The whole time since like that 185 era to now that we've been talking about, there hasn't been a Spawn movie. There hasn't been a Spawn video game. There hasn't been a Spawn animated series. And now, Ty McFarlane, now he's a talker, but he's talking Spawn spinoff comic, Misery. He's talking Spawn children's animated series based on like that itty bitty Spawn. That we saw in like the Spawn Kills the the Universe. Um, we're talking about a Spawn adult uh, animated series similar to what we got in HBO. Which if you haven't seen that but you've got the HBO app, check that out. It's amazing. And then Todd McFarlane recently said this movie is still coming. So all of this popularity that we've seen for Spawn over the last 10 years has happened with no movie. Um, uh, what's going to happen? Oh, and he said a video game is coming. He said he's in, working on a video game. So what happens when all of that, or if all of that, comes to fruition? What happens if there's just one animated series, a movie, and a video game out? What if Spawn toys end up back in stores? If all of that happens, and Spawn becomes more important in the zeitgeist of America and beyond, suddenly there will be more of a run on these Spawn comics. And I'm talking about my play on this is if none of that happens. My play on this is just based on history. Um, if you're a new speculator, don't don't shy on this. Listen to what I'm telling you because, again, we believe in transparency on this channel. I'm just trying to give you my experience. That's all. I'm trying to tell you what I've seen uh, and help you avoid some of the mistakes I've made so you're not chasing books. <coughs> um, but if any of that happens... This could be a monster. So that is why this is my long-term play of the week. And I think those reasons are more solid than speculating on a last page, flash page of a new character. To me, that was just the cherry on the top. That just made it that much better. Yeah, I would say also don't sit there and try to spec on what cover is going to pop. Just buy what you like. <laughs> buy the right. cover that, like, that, that you like. I mean, that's... You're you're not going to know that for a while. Yeah. You're not going to know that until you start to see them drying up. Unless you see them, like he said, in their 75% off TFAW or Midtown sales. Then you can start buying up some covers. But <coughs> Right. And that's what I, I'll be full transparency. That's what I'm going to do. I, Brian and I talked about this. We both ordered some of them because we didn't want to miss out. Um, but we didn't go heavy on them. I will, I will go heavy if I can get them at like 75% off. Then I'll jump on board. If I can get them for $2 a cover, I'm all in. And that's going to give us Jack's long-term play for this week. So there was one book that I liked that wasn't on the Bolo list that I kind of wanted to talk about just briefly real quick. And yeah, little bonus long-term play <laughs> from uh, from my man Brian Wood. Go ahead. Hit him with it. I'm ready to take notes, Brian. I won't even, know. I won't even say it's long-term play, just a book that I liked. And that was... Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order Dark Temple number one. Now this is based on a video game that's coming out in November. I'm a video game guy. I'm really looking forward to playing this. I saw like the E3 footage, but this is like a prequel leading up to that. And we've seen some of those prequel type video game comics take off. Um, we saw that with uh, the Justice. What was the uh, the Mortal Kombat yeah, style the Injustice? Yeah. yeah. When Justice, we saw that one that shoot that B that variant B cover variant for that still going for like a four zero very good on my comic shop raw right now still like thirty bucks because it just came up on my want list that's why I know but this one I also like because it's prequel to the video game so you get the video game tie over you also get the Star Wars fan that's liking it and it also introduces two new characters which is on the cover A that you see there. And you have the first appearance of, I'm going to kill this name, I'm sure, but it's like Seer Junda, C-E-R-E-J-U-N-D-A, who's a Padawan, Jedi, a young African-American female, and then her master there also, who is Master Cordova. So, 
those three things all wrapped up into one. And I didn't hear many people talking about this book this week. It's available for cover. It does have the 1 in 10 game variant that you see on the right. And those are going, you can get this for $7 right now. So book may not do anything, but with that kind of buy-in with two new characters and it being Star Wars and tied to a video game, all those things were enough for me to pull the trigger on it. And I read it. Typical kind of first issue sets up the storyline. Um, I think it's a five-issue miniseries leading up to the, the video game. But uh, the video game comes out in November, I believe. But that was a book that didn't see on the bolo list. Kind of had it in weekly picks, but I didn't get a weekly picks video done this week. So I wanted to talk about it here on the Bolo Show. And if you guys read this as well, or let me know in the chat, what do you guys think about this book? Um, I can't keep up with all the Star Wars books. because it's just a, a, a lot out there right now, so I read what I can. This one, especially um, Galaxy's Edge, is the two books that I've been reading. So, so that's, I yeah. like it, Brian. I like it. I like it. Not just for, like we talked about before the show. Star Wars books are underplayed, um, but then you've also got the fact that, like you said, it's a it's a prequel to the video game, so you could get those that gamer verse heat. Um, so I could see that. Yeah, and I was talking to uh, a good CBSI Star Wars expert before we we started filming this, and that was Mike Morello, just because I was excited to see if he'd read the book yet, and uh, he hadn't read it yet, but he's looking forward to. So, but yeah, just putting that out there. So. I do want to say one other thing. Always talking about 80s kids. If you guys have not watched The Dark Crystal Age of Resistance on Netflix, do so. If you're a Dark Crystal fan, if you enjoyed that Jim Henson 80s movie, the, it's a 10-episode series. Freaking gorgeous. I found myself lost in the story because I was watching going, how did they do that? Because it's practical. It's puppets. There's minimal CGI. So the set is just like in the 80s. Um, Puppets and sets and gorgeous. I found myself getting lost going, man, how'd they make these puppets or how'd they do that? And the story's fantastic. Um, and, and I'll ask you, Brian, real quick before we get out of here. Um, we, we talked about the spec of the upcoming Dark Crystal book right. relating to the series. Your review of that, I, I was, I was kind of like, ah, I'll catch Dark Crystal whenever. But your review is similar to what I've heard from a lot of people. A lot of people have really enjoyed it. I won't um, even say this, think, but for if you don't want to watch it, there's an hour and a half documentary on the making of this Netflix series that goes in depth. The voice talent in there, I couldn't believe that. I mean, you got Simon Pegg, you got Mark Hamill, you got Natalie Dormer, you got uh, Lena Headley, Headley, Cersei. <laughs> yeah, Taylor Egerton. Yeah, yeah. So that's my my thing is: do you think do you think that um, it's that those boom books, the upcoming boom series, is maybe even a little better of a spec play. Maybe it's one that's under people's kind of under the radar because, you know, the series, the FOC was right when the series was dropping, and now the series has dropped. There's buzz on it. I think it would be, especially because it definitely leads you into the, um, the, that there's a second, I mean, there's definitely, it, it's open ending as if there's going to be a second season for it, right? Mm -hmm. And then, of course, I read that. Netflix won't let you know if there's a second season until it's been like released for about four weeks or so. But you can tell the creators open it up. It takes place. This is a prequel that takes place before the movie. Um, but I will tell you, I got so immersed in it last weekend that I watched it through the first couple episodes. I was kind of not paying as much attention. And then I got hooked into like episode four or five. So I watched it through and then I go, oh, there's a making of. So I watched the hour and a half making of and got more interested. And then I watched the movie from 1983 two or whatever it was and uh then i went back and started watching the episodes that i wasn't really paying attention to and yeah i got really into dark crystal again this weekend and it's a great series series so will you be buying the comics i'm yeah i'm subs i'm actually i went in and i subscribed wow to the there you go to the comics from boom just for the story um spec wise it could be there it depends on how many people like feel the same way i do all right <laughs> Oh, if they get into, but how big the print run's going to be, you don't know. And then it'd be interesting to see those, the Beneath Dark Crystal and Power of Dark Crystal, the other Boom series that came out previously. So, but yeah, I just wanted to say, highly recommend that. I highly recommend that Netflix series. And that's going to wrap up our Bolo show, but we got 
one more show this week, and that's tomorrow night, right, Jack? Absolutely. And that's gonna be a fun one. It, it's, me too. It, it's, oh yeah. It's Friday, right? It's time for some. It's it's like happy hour type show. <laughs> yes, yes. It's time to pull pull up a stool, sit at the bar, uh, and uh, talk with some friends yeah. about uh, it's last call. It's it's that last moment. Uh, you know, it's time to make your picks, and we all we all know what that's like, right? You, we've all been at that bar last call. Lights are coming on soon, and you gotta make you gotta make that choice. So. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got to do it before the lights come on. Yeah. So um, we've all been there, right? So that's the last call show. It's uh, the pre-FOC show. We're talking on Friday nights now. Um, it's a regular series. It is not a mini. It wasn't a one-shot. We are full on. Uh, it is our regular Friday night programming. And we are going to be talking pre-FOC, whether the speculation community likes it or not. And uh, we are here to try to share our knowledge and what we see and highlight 10 books that we think are kind of the most appealing on the FOC list. And I'll tell you guys, it's hard. 10 books is tough. It's tough to whittle it down to 10. Each of the first two weeks we've done, we've had about 15 to 16 books we've liked. And it's been it's been tough to kind of get it to 10. So I'll also make a pitch. Head to simplemanscomics.com on Fridays and check out the complete FOC list. And you've got till 10 p.m. on uh Monday to go ahead and get your order in. So contact your LCS. We absolutely want you to support LCSs over those online retailers, or get in touch with your online retail favorite online retailer if you know you've got one of those janky LCSs marking you up on product, not taking care of you, not fulfilling your orders. If you've already tried, you know go ahead and hit those online retailers or search out those online retailers that have got those great uh, deals for pre FOC orders. And if you just don't know where to order from, check out our sponsors, SlabbedHeroes.com and Frankie'sComics.com, both of which take pre-FOC orders. Right. And one thing, because I've heard a bunch of times where people are getting orders in it, pre-FOC, and then on release day they're going, and then the comic stores are telling them that they were allocated or don't have it. Um, may work, may not work, but ask them if you can kind of just prepay. I mean, some LCSs have you prepay, but... Sometimes they'll they'll be more holding to their commitment if you've paid for it. I mean, that is if they really didn't get allocated. If they got allocated, there's nothing you can do, and then they'll just refund your money. But if they're just saying that to kind of sell it, because some LCSs do that, um, sometimes prepay might help avoid that. But yeah, there's very few allocations in the comics market. That's just reality, and that's a hot term right now because of once in the future. So because of Once in Future, I have a feeling LCSs are going to go to that, oh, I got allocated argument more and more often. So Brian and I both have talked about that. We're advocates of prepaying over putting it on a pull list and then you're banking on, oh, I've got it taken care of. And then you have to rely on the store to make sure that they are taking care of it. Um, if you can, prepay. It also helps out the LCS, helps out their cash flow. They don't have to sweat it and worry about it. Yeah, yeah you don't have pictures of female sitting on the floor with a bunch of books around her <laughs> right pick up your and subscription box and here's another pitch talk to your lcs a lot of lcs's will give you an increased discount if you prepay yeah so pitch that to them they may that may not be something they have available but if you throw that out they may be willing to to make that move yeah. so with that being said that's our show for tonight and we'll see you right here during the premiere and in the live chat tomorrow night 9 p.m eastern for the last call show Final order cutoff. See you then.